Mr. Ford, I'm, I'll probably get the pronunciation wrong, but I believe your real name is Sean O'Feen, is it, or Fine? How, how Irish are you? Are you 100% Irish? Oh, that's really bad. O'Fana. Sean O'Fana. Mm -hmm. When did you come to America? I was born here. What sort of a childhood did you have? Were you interested in movies way back? Not really. I'm not interested in them now, actually. But it's a way of making a living. No, uh... Oh, I don't know. Occasionally go to movies and, uh... I was not particular. I wasn't what you call an aficionado or anything like that. It's were they hard times, or were you reasonably... Mm -hmm. Were they hard times, or were you reasonably well-to-do as a family? Uh, hard times where? But what sort of childhood did you have? Were you poor or well-to-do? My father, you mean? Yeah. We were comfortably well off. We had a little barn on the farm in uh, Maine. He had a big farm there, and he was a farmer and a fisherman, just as he was in Galway, Ireland. And, uh... We ate better then than we do now. No, we were like, you know, what? Let's say, you know, we are comfortable, lower middle class family, as you would say in England. <laughs> How did you get your start in the motion picture business? And tell me about the film The Scrapper. Well, thank you, pardon. How did you get your start in motion pictures? And, and could you tell me about the film called The Scrapper? Well, I don't know. I was, I think it was in 1919. It was after World War I, I know, and uh, uh, they had an actor named Harry Carey, who they were about to let go. His contract was running out in four weeks, but they uh, wanted to do a picture, a couple of two reelers with him, and uh, so Carl Lemley, who liked me very much, I was, at that time, I was an assistant director, suggested that I do these. So we went out and made a picture called, I think the Three Godfathers. And they cut it and came out in five reels and they showed it to him and uh, he said, that's very good, and said, release it. And they said, oh, no, no, this is a two-reeler. We can't release a carry picture in five reels. This is a two-reeler. And he said, well, if I go to a tailor for a suit of clothes and he throws in an extra pair of pants, what do I do, throw the pants back? <laughs> he said, that's a good picture. So it, when I was a five-reeler, uh, matter of fact, it, uh, the picture did very, very well. And... Uh, so he did another one, and they re-signed Carey. And then we had a change of management. I was getting $50 a week, so as a director, they cut me to 35 I don't know why. <laughs> and that was it. What is your other question? Well, can you tell me about the film called The Scrapper? I don't remember it. You played in it, and I have a review. I have a synopsis of the day. Can I read you the synopsis? I'd rather you wouldn't. <laughs> if I, I'd, I'd like to remind you, please. It says... I, I remember vaguely it was a stunt picture. Yeah. I used to double my brother in all his stunts. I was just fresh from a uh, varsity football team and was in pretty good shape. And all the stunts, we looked very much alike, I, I uh, <clears throat> doubled from. And I wanted to make a very cheap, very cheap picture. And uh, so they asked me to play the lead. There was no acting, and it was all stunts, I mean. Right. Running at 40 miles an hour, hang, get, catching uh, an express train and jumping horses off cliffs and that sort of thing. Yeah, your and name... I fortunately came through with uh, no accidents, but uh, I don't remember much about the picture. It says, Buck the Scrapper loses his girl who, no, 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 no. who goes to the city. Well, I'd you were like called, you were called, it. Buck the Scrapper. <laughs> I would like to forget about it. Okay. I prefer that they turn on to the BBC musical, isn't it? The musical hour. That's right. Uh-huh. Can you give me a, 
uh, a flavour or what you remember most about filmmaking in 1917 and 18? Was it really as primitive as everybody suggests? Well, I hardly think that primitive is the right word. In those days, I mean, we had no lights and we had a big stage, just, just a board. And over that, we stretched uh, cambric, a cam uh, cotton, to hold the light off. And there'd be five or six uh, companies working side by side. And uh, as a matter of fact, I mean, it wasn't... We didn't think it was primitive. We thought it was rather nice. It was fun. We all knew one another and visited back and forth. And uh, we exchanged actors and we'd go over and say, do you mind coming over and playing a butler for us? Well, not a butler. We didn't use butlers in those days. They were mostly westerns. And uh, uh, it was all very lovely. And Hollywood then, or what it's called, geographically called Hollywood, a place that none of us can define. We don't know where it is. But, I mean, everybody says Hollywood. I mean, for example, this is not Hollywood. And I don't believe there is uh, any studios in Hollywood, but uh, it's just a mass of orange groves. Yes, sorry, please. Sorry. Well, right from Manchester, I'd boast about it. Can I get scene 261, take one. You know all about the Battle of Lewes, and don't the you? The Battle of Lewes, right, yeah. That's strange for an Englishman. I may know anything about English history. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was only us Irish that knew about English history. <laughs> the Iron Horse remains one of the most epic silent westerns ever made. Were you interested in westerns before this, or was it this that fired your imagination? Well, when I left school, I went to college and I didn't like it. I looked at my curriculum and this was stuff I'd had in what we call high, what we call high school or grammar school. And I said, why waste my time learning this stuff? And I didn't like, particularly like college life, so I left and worked my way west and I punched cows for a while. I uh, worked in Arizona as a cowboy and eventually ended up in Hollywood. But uh, did you ask me why I liked the West? Or I was it was it this film particularly that started your tremendous interest in the West, or had you been interested many years before? You have to rephrase a question. I mean, I don't. Well, this was your first really big it's Western. Here that doesn't work for BBC. <laughs> <to rephrase. laughs> This was, this was your first really big Western. Yes. Had you always been interested in the West before that, or was it this that set you off on the Western kick? Not particularly. I'm not interested in the West. I just, you know. I'd like to make Western pictures because I like the people that I work with. I'd like to get in location. I'd like to leave this place with the small <coughs> smog and fog and traffic and... Uh, what do you call them? Speedways, freeways, and I like to get out, you know, and live in the open. You work hard, you get up early, you work late, you eat dinner with an appetite, you sleep well. But I do like the people you meet and that you work with. And that is really my only interest in Westerns. As story material, I, uh, I'm not particularly fascinated by them. I mean, it's not my mess here by any amount of means. None of my so-called better pictures are westerns, and uh, uh, for some reason or other, I'm sort of described as a western director. But I was born and brought up in the state of Maine, of Irish parentage. I think uh, I think this is true because one of uh, one of my favourites of your films is uh, *Prisoner of Shark Island*, which is uh, certainly not a western. 
But it, it, it's a very interesting piece of Americana. W what interested you in that particular story? No, oh, nothing. Just a job to do. I was under contract. They told me to do it, so I did it. it I like the story of Dr. Mudd, and of course, a great admirer of Mr. Lincoln, and well, I rather like the whole idea of the thing. It's one of your more ignored movies. Most, uh, it doesn't crop up in a lot of the books about you, and yet I think it's a very fine film. And yet people talk endlessly about the informer and stagecoach. Um, does this amuse you or irritate you? About Shark Island? Yes, and some of your lesser known films, which I think are just as good. Well, uh, it doesn't annoy me because I've never read anything about myself. I don't read magazines or picture magazines or... I know in France, for example, I mean, they've written five or six books, the Danes have written a book, and... Sorry, sorry, I'll show Yeah, that's true, that's... Everything happened right there. Oh, there's a little... Uh, tell me about the film you made called Lost Patrol in the Desert. A little picture you did in less than... Well, less than three weeks. It wasn't supposed to be a big picture, it was just a B picture, and... It was very interesting. We had a lot of fun. We were down in the desert. And we got up at 6 o'clock and started working at 7 because of the sun. From 11 on until 2 or 2.30, it would be impossible to work out there in that heat. And uh, I remember we had a, uh, one of the first of the so-called producers was on this picture. He was a nice fellow. He was a good friend of mine. And... Uh, I didn't mind him, but we had a very difficult shot as where the uh, British cavalry was supposed to come into the rescue, and it was very hard. They had to ride way around, you know, so they wouldn't mark up the sand and get in a certain position, and uh, finally got in position, and uh, the commander of the troop was our expert, our Technical expert, an ex major in the uh, Australian night horse. Or should I say night horse? And uh, Australian night horse. <laughs> and uh, he was all set, and I gave him the thing. He started to come on. When this airplane flew over their heads, and of course the horses scattered. And they finally landed this little satellite airfield we had, and this idiot producer got out with a big cigar and said, you know, and I said, well, you son of a, you know, you know, you know. and of course it spoiled the shot for that day, and we had to do it and wait till the next day. So, uh, he said to me, Jack, I've been looking over your schedule, pardon me, schedule, and uh, he said, yeah, you work, at, start working at seven, and then you quit at 11 and start working from 2.30 till 3. He said, now look at those hours you're losing. Now if you work right on through, you'd finish five or six days ahead. And I said, uh, Cliff, I said, you can't work in the seat. He says, he says, it's wonderful. I love it. He says, this is great. He says, I mean, why? Why? What the heat that doesn't bother you? I'm, I'm enjoying it. the heat. You know, he said, I feel you don't boom. I said, I'm sorry, I've got to line this shot up again that you spoiled, you know, see, well. And he wandered away, and uh, we finally get the shot, and I says, uh, uh, well, there's Mr. So-and-so, I'd like to talk to him. He says, Mr. So-and-so? I said, yes, the so-called producer that flew in last night. And I said, I said, we've just taken him to the hospital with a sunstroke. <laughs> I'm afraid that I roared with laughter with great glee. What <laughs> <laughs> a great story. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ford, in the poor fellow, I'll never forget, he was, was wool be gone. I went out to the hospital looking and he's pale and worn. And he says, hello, Jack. <laughs> so wool be gone, you know. <laughs> Go ahead. In between making a lot of uh, A pictures, you turned out scores and scores of, of 
what is termed in England at any rate B pictures. I don't know really what the phrase means, but anyway, that's what they call them. W was this bread and butter work, or, what, or were you all the while broadening your experience? Now, I think one trouble of the director in this country, and I think, you know, uh, one of the trouble of the directors in universally is they'll make a big picture, it might probably a hit, and then they try to top it, eh? and usually fall flat on their face. It happens here a lot, and I know it happens with you. So I try to make it a rule, if you make a big picture, which is a hit, the next one do a cheap picture, relax, I mean three or four weeks, eh? while you're preparing for a, uh, another story. And usually, of course, I mean to my mind, the little picture is always better. See, my favorite picture, for example, is one you've never heard of called the sun shines bright. Have you? Great. Huh? Judge Billy Priest. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, that's my favorite picture. The Republic. That's right. Great. Well, we just made the uh, Quiet Man, which is a big hit. So I wanted to change, you know, sort of just for, uh, do something else. And we did this thing. I loved it. We had a lot of fun doing it. And uh, so that's why. But some people keep on trying to top themselves where well, you can't. Sure. You return again and again to the small town American Southern scene with films like Judge Priest, Steamboat Round the Bend, The Sun Shines Bright. What is your particular fascination with the Southern scene? I don't know. Instinct. I'm married to a Southerner. Matter of fact, there is a grandfather's flag, Confederate flag there. It's still one of the few things left over from the war between the states. Uh, oh, I don't know. It just, hap just happens. I have no particular love for the South or any more than I have for the West. I'm still a state of Maine. But you've got it on the screen like no other de director ever has. Well, I don't know. Probably my instinct or, some, or luck or know, whatever you wish to call it. I wouldn't know. I couldn't, I couldn't give you a lucid answer on that. Tell me how you managed to do that extraordinary steamboat race in Steamboat Round the Bend. Were those, uh, was that all real? Did you really have about uh, 15 steamboats? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Where did you find them all? On the Sacramento River in California, Northern California. They were all up there. We just hired them and where they went. Don Sawyer had brought up is they changed the company just about then. I had left a new producer, a new producing organization came to take over the company and they they cut the picture to pieces. They cut most of the comedy out. It was a very funny picture, but this fellow had no sense of humor, and all the comedy was cut out. And he tried to make a dramatic picture out of it, which it wasn't. It was a, it was comedy, pure and simple. The lassoing of the preacher off the, uh, off the riverboat landing. Right. That well, if you call this net here, it should do about a little larger. In 263, take one. Give me another slide. Second, second, uh, I suspect that a lot of your scripts are very improvised, and I believe that one of the arch exponents of this was Will Rogers. Can you tell me about him? Will you make a statement and ask a, ask a question? A lot of my scripts are improvised. Exactly what do you mean by that? That you start with basic material and then work around it. Well, I think any good director would do that. I'm in a script as a skeleton that you work on. If it's a good script, you do it, I mean, verbatim. But how often do you get a script that you can do verbatim? I mean, I remember once upon a time, I mean, the so-called producer and the writer was a very dear friend of mine. He says, this is the greatest script I've ever written. He says, Jack, I want you to promise me now that you'll do this word for word. 
as I solemnly swear, I will do it word for word. So I did this script, and did this picture. We only went five weeks over schedule. And it came out when the final first cut was 18 reels. And, uh, you know, well, of course, I, just, I did it verbatim. Every word in the script is in there. Yeah. There were the longest speeches. Of, God, speeches, one speech I know read four pages. Yeah. But I did it word for word, word for word. And I had to do it over and over again because it's almost impossible, you know, for a person, I mean, to, you know, memorize that. But I didn't run 18 reels and they, they said, how are you going to cut it down? I said, I'm not going to cut it down. You're going to cut it down. I just directed and did it exactly the way you wanted. And I said, there was your picture. It was a horrible picture. And when it finally came out of them and they finally did get it down to eight reels, it was horrible. Will Rogers obviously uh, got around this. H how did he work? Meaning what? I believe that Will Rogers had his... to have sort of a language barrier here. I believe Will Rogers had his own way of, uh, of approaching a script. No, that isn't true because he never approached a script in his life. I don't think he ever saw one. I mean, you get there in the morning and say, Will, this is what you're supposed to say. Words to this effect. And he'd read it, memorize And when the times, now he would say it in his own words. And they were much better than what the writer wrote because nobody could write for Will Rogers. Because Will Rogers has more humor than all the writers in the world. And he'd just say it in his own way which was always, you know, which was good. And you never bother just let him go along and uh, leave him alone. But as far as, you know, he, he'd, never, he'd never read and study a script word for word and try to repeat it. I just take it and say it in your own words. And he would. And it always came out right. Because he's a very, very humorous man. But he was always wonderful to work with because he was full of, of uh, suggestion. It would be all right here if I said so. I said, great. Go ahead, say it. Well, he, was, he was a delight to work with. He was just a delight to work with. Are you growing a mustache? Hmm? I'm trying. I'm trying to. <laughs> Ex-guardsman? <laughs> Go ahead. Stagecoach was the first time you went out to Monument Valley, and you subsequently went out, I believe, many times. What was your fascination with this particular location? Well, I don't know. That's rather a peculiar remark. I knew about this, and I said, someday I hope you're up there and make a picture. And the chap that ran the, oh, the trading post, Harry Goulding, and I'd been up there, I used to stay with him occasionally, he says, you know, the Navajos are starving. He says, I understand you're going to do a Western. Is If you come up there and do it, he says, you probably, you'll be doing them a great thing and probably save a lot of lives and, uh, it would certainly be a great help. And I says, I've always wanted, and uh, always wanted to do a picture up there. And I went to Walter Wayne, who had owned the company, and said, I told him about this place. He says, go ahead, do it. And we went up there, and I think we left four or five thousand, hundred thousand dollars there. And uh, this put these people on their feet. We paid each one of them. I mean, a man that rode a horse, and provided his own horse, got $10 a day. The women got $5 a day, and the children got $3 a day. So, I mean, it actually put them on their feet, and they appreciated it. 
And if nobody else, if anybody else tries to come in there, they object. They don't want anybody in there but me. I went up, you say many times, that which is not quite true. I went up there several times. Of course, many times that's, you're from Manchester? Manchester. Well, that's typical Manchester exaggeration. I mean, that's probably where that cookery came from, Manchester. Uh, I've been, I haven't been up there, I've been up there several times. But I love to work up there, it's a nice place. And as far as I'm getting the best in stagecoach, I don't quite agree with you. I think you've done it better in other pictures. But I'm on their, I am an, I am an honorary chief. I'm on their board of, uh, on the Indian board. And they have a name for me, a Navajo name. And, over the years, I mean, since I've been up there, I've picked up, I can, I'm not fluent, but I can talk to them in Navajo. What is your name in Indian? Most one I don't like, Natani Nez, means tall soldier. And I'm not a soldier, I'm a Navy man. And I object to it very strongly, but they have no word for sailor. So, I let it go. You can see these pictures around the wall. You don't see any army people. They're all Navy. Natani Nez, tall soldier. And uh, even if I go up there on vacation, they come in from the hills and they all gather and sort of reception. I'd have to kiss all the babies as if I were running for office in Bermondsey. <laughs> Incidentally, how did the elections come out? I mean, the... Uh, the local elections. The local elections. Ah? Well, they were a disaster for Labour. They were a disaster for the Labour government. What? Well, well, you naturally, I mean, being in picture business, you're all socialites or labor rights. Mm. Yeah, I remember a very funny story. I was in, in England. I always used the same driver. His name is Hoskins. And an excise and major of the uh, Black Watch. And he always drives me, wonderful driver. And we were out, we went out across the river. I wanted to see the uh, St. George's Inn or something where Shake, they used to put on the Shakespearean plays in the courtyard. What is it called? The George Inn Southwark. Huh? George Inn Southwark. That's it, yeah. Southwark. We went out there and had lunch, and I wanted to see it and look at it. And I'm driving back. I said to the two lordlings, I says, uh, how do you boys vote when you go to the House of Lords? And they says, oh, socialist, you know, that's the thing to do, you know. Uh, that's it, you know, you're the smart thing, you're a socialist. And I said, oh, yes, yes, socialist. Maybe you're socialist, yes. So I asked Mr. Oskins, you know, I says, Oskins, how do you vote? He says, conservative, sir, good old Winnie. <laughs> and uh, they looked at him as a bride and they started to laugh and he says, Hoskins, you've just got two more conservative votes. <laughs> oh, that's the thing you're doing. It's a small thing, you know, labor. Mm -hmm. To return to movies, however briefly, because all you're saying is well, fascinating. Well, just tell me, tell me about you your... You want to talk about English politics? It's fascinating, yeah, if you want to. No, it is, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Tell is Frank about... Packingham still in uh, politics? Frank Packingham? Not to my knowledge. I don't think so. No. No. We have Enoch Powell, though. Hmm? We have, we have Mr. Enoch Powell. He's just put the cat among the pigeons. Who? Mr. Enoch Powell. I don't know him. Ah. I don't Packingham. Oh, that's right. He's, he's in the House of Lords now anyway. His brother died. He's now the Earl of Longford. But I imagine he's still... He's... Uh, He's socialist. He's uh, he's a professional politician. Mm. Go ahead. You want to talk about movies, not politics. <laughs> Can you tell me about your lifelong association with John Wayne and how you first met, please? Hi, welcome. Hello, please. What are you doing? Picking a new shirt. Ah, two six four. Table at night. Late afternoon. Oh, well. The sound is on. We better not continue that part of the conversation. 
Go ahead. You were talking about John Wayne and my lifelong association with him. How did you first strike up your lifelong association with John Wayne? Well, number one is not lifelong. Uh, I've known Duke about, Duke as we call him, about 30 years. He was my third assistant prop man. Then he became the second prop man. He finally worked himself up to prop man. And we started to do stagecoach and, uh, oh, everybody turned it down. I had to peddle it around. And finally, Walter Wanger, you know, he says, well, you got a picture? He says, you know, what, a Western? He says, well, go ahead and do it. He says, he says, who do you want to use for a lead? I says, I've got a kid here. He's uh, just out of college. I've used him in several bits, and he's very good. Big, tall, handsome guy. And I'd like to make a test of him, uh, test of him uh, show it to you. He said, well, if you say he's okay, oh, okay, and you, I'll make the test. So I made a test, and he says, yeah, he says, go ahead, great. And so Walter went off to Europe, and we made the picture with Duke, and that sort of started him off. But uh, we've always been very friendly, and... Uh, I'm the godfather of all, of all of his children, and he has many, and his grandchildren, of which he has more. So, we're very close. Can you tell me about the incredible story of your filming of the Battle of the Midway? What is incredible about it? You running out there with a camera under, under direct attack. I did what? That you were taking shots yourself and directing shots while the place was literally under, part of the place was under attack. And they ran a flag up. A Marine ran out and actually ran a flag up, the American flag, while the place was literally being blasted to hell. Well, that's what I was getting paid for. There's nothing extraordinary about that. Now, I was on this tower to report, you know, to the uh, officers who were 50, 50 feet under the ground, exactly, I mean, the position of the Japanese planes and the numbers and so forth and so on. And uh, meanwhile, I had a little 16 millimeter camera. I had one boy with me, but I uh, says, you're too young to get killed. So I hid him away, I thought, in a safe place. And uh, so uh, I just kept reporting the different things. I said, there's a plane out there. All our planes shot down, man in parachutes, jab to shot the parachute. He may have landed, and the PT ball went out, you know, and uh, I just reported the different things and took the picture. I don't think nothing should... I was getting paid for it. That's what I was in the Navy for. What else could you do? Well, a lot of people would have run like hell. I can tell you what they would have done. Oh, I don't think so. And I was doing all right until I had a blast of shrapnel that knocked me... It really... I had wounded pretty badly there. But however, I managed to come too long enough to finish the job. And there's nothing extraordinary about it. I mean, it's... Uh, what you're getting paid for. You've worked with a lot of old-timers, people like Tom Mix, Hoot Gibson, and even William S. Hart. No, I never worked with William S. Hart. He was a very dear friend, but I've never, I never worked with him. Hmm. Were they a different uh, breed of cowboy from your Joel McRae's and your, uh, your uh, Gary Cooper's? Well, that's a pretty difficult question to an ask. Or to answer, rather. Well, I don't know. I never considered Joel McRae, I mean, a cowboy. And Gary Cooper certainly not a cowboy. Although he was born in Wyoming and probably brought up on a ranch. 
and Joe became a cowboy, I mean, in pictures. But uh, they're all the same, they're just playing their parts. They're actors, and they're supposed to be versatile, and they were. But I, I, and I couldn't make any differentiation between them. You know. All I know, they're all nice people. <laughs> Yet, do you see, though, the, the systematic destruction of the Indian, the Red Indian, as something inevitable or a blot on American history? Hmm. Somebody translate that for me. What do you say? Do you think that the destruction... What did that say that? What did he, what did he ask me? Do you think the killing of the Redskins, the extermination of the Redskins? Huh? What about, he was asking about the destruction of the Redskins. Do you see it as a block on American history? Destruction of what? Of the Redskins, the, Indian, the Indian. American Indian. Do you see it as a blot on American history? Well, Cheyenne Autumn was, was just about the most eloquent, moving film I've ever seen on the subject of the poor goddamn Indian who was cheated out of all his land, his hunting I mean, ground. that's a political question. I don't think it has anything to do with pictures. I would, uh, you know, I would, I would, all I can say was no comment. I don't know. I wasn't alive then. I had nothing to do with it. My sympathy is all with the Indians. I mean, any more than the invasion of the black and tans into Ireland. Do you consider that a blot on English history? Hmm? Do you remember that in 21? Mm-hmm. Well, I, being Irish, it's my prerogative to, add, to answer a question with a question. Do you consider that a blot on English history? I think some historians would, as I think some historians would regard the, the systematic destruction of the Indian as something terrible. No, I'm not talking about the Indians, I'm talking about the black and tans. I don't know enough about it. Mm. Same thing, everybody, all countries do the same thing. I mean, there's like this fellow named Hitler doing it, Stalin. Genocide seems to be a commonplace thing in our lives. But it was not a systematic destruction of the Indians. However, that's politics. And that has nothing to do with pictures. I'd rather, I would rather not discuss it any more than I... As long as you won't answer my question about the black and tans in Ireland, I, I won't answer your question about the Indians. Okay, Pax. All I know, Pax. All I know is the cavalry got the hell kicked out of them. I mean, <laughs> and the Indians practically destroyed themselves. It was the loss of the buffalo herds that wiped them out. There's a story that on the film Wee Willie Winkie, after the death in the film of Victor McClaglin, you quite spontaneously suggested that they include a funeral scene. Can you tell me how that happened? Well, we went out there, and it was raining. And I says, I know, I've been to India, and it rains like the Dickens there. I said, let's do it in the rain. The cameraman agreed, we had lights there, so we did it in the rain, that's all. I said, let's put it in the funeral. I said, it's a mistake. I said, it's a mistake in the story to kill McGlaglin off. He was one of the leading characters. But at least if you're going to kill him off, I mean, let's give him a funeral. But it was in the rain. I said, so let's shoot it in the rain, which we did. And that's all it took. Just in order to fill in the day's work. It amazes me, though, that you, you can work so spontaneously. How did you... Uh how did you organize it? How did I what? Organize it. It looks like a sequence that would have taken a week to shoot, and instead you tell me you did it in a day. Oh, no, we didn't do it in a day. Nothing of the sort. We did it in about an hour and a quarter. Let's put it down to Irish instinct. 
<laughs> okay. Would you say you were hard on your actors, or do you get to your results with kindness and friendship? Well, the only way I can answer that is that everybody that I've ever worked with is always anxious to come back and work with me again. I am not hard on actors. I can always realize an actor's capability. Sorry. 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 Okay. And here we go. Being rude about actors. Being rude about actors, yeah. Uh, scene two, six, five, take one. Uh, what were we talking? Actors and how you work with them. Well, I don't know. I mean, they're human beings. As I say, all I know is that anybody's ever worked with me, they always actually to come back and work with me again. I never stand behind the camera and yell directions. I go up and I speak to each actor individually, so the vulture, so the others don't hear, and everything is thoroughly rehearsed, and I try to get the first take. And, uh, they say directors being hard on actors. Those directors don't usually last very long in pictures. I've known of several that were hard on actors, but uh, they've gone with the wind. How do our English directors? I mean, David Lean is very nice on actors, isn't he? Very. Hmm? Very. Really? David's a very good friend of mine, incidentally. I was sorry to hear about Tony Asquith. Uh, what happened to him? Heart? He'd been ill for some time. He'd been ailing for a long time. And he, uh, as well as directing, he was also president of the English Union, of the I Film Union, that, as yeah. you know. And I, he really... I'm a member of the English Union. He made me an honorary member of it, yes. Mm. And he re literally did work himself into the ground. Mm. His death was very, very keenly felt in England. He was a wonderful fellow. I was very fond of him. Mm. Great visual sense. His movies mm. were always great. Got the, his brother has the title. Hasn't he? he has an older brother who has the title. The Earl of Asquith. Earl of Asquith and Oxford. That's right. Don't you know any English history? All I know is movies. Oh. Now, I bet you've never been out to lose. <laughs> and you come from Manchester. Mm -hmm. Speaking of England, or well, it was not of England, but I happened to be looking at that cookery over there. It's a funny story connected with that. Would you care to hear it? Very much. It applies to England. I had my group in Burma, where we are forward in the forest. It is a mix, mostly naval, but we had Marines and soldiers. And we hired a lot of Gurkhas, Nepalese, who are too old. I mean, for the present war, they're all rated men. Matter of fact, uh, the commander was a Havildar major. And of course they were furious, you know, but they were, you know, their sons were in the war and they weren't. And uh, they did a terrific job for us. I mean, they were great soldiers. And they were great jungle fighters. And as I was leaving, they presented me with this kukri. And the Havildar major said it was the first one that's ever been presented to a uh, non-Nepalese. This is very, very interesting. That is a... Uh, he says, that's a chief's kukri. Uh, very, very special. I don't little knives here and everything. Mm -hmm. But I'm very proud of that. I consider it a great honor. And boy, how they could use them. 
You've got some great mementos in this room. Are you a memento collector? And I what? A memento collector. I am not. Are you really interested in the past at all? In the what? The past. The past. The past? The past. Oh. The past. Not the past. It's the past. The past. Or meaning in the past. Or the past. Oh. Am I interested or certainly? I majored in history and I'm very much interested. Mostly in English history. Naturally, in order to lick them, I mean, you've got to know them. But, uh, <laughs> certainly I'm interested in them. But these things, I'm not a collector, they just happen to gather through the years. I mean, all these fellows over there, there's some famous people there. I mean, all the admirals, every admiral up there is a four-star admiral. There's my old board boss, Wild, General Wild Bill Donovan, most decorated man in World War II, one. And the gentleman of the khaki uniform is Admiral Johnny Bulkley, the most decorated man in World War II. It's just coincidentally side by side. But of course, Bill's pictures from World War I, they're all, all for us, uh, I don't know what that is over there. It's a little picture. Oh, that's, that's General Dove and I just before we jumped in behind the lines in Burma, getting ready to make this stupid jump, which came off, however. It's all right. And I don't know. They're all mementos, they're all things, you know, you gather over the years. I mean, I never have, I myself am not a collector, and uh, people give you things. There is a saddle, I mean, speaking of being mean to actors, there is a saddle that's worth, oh, I would imagine a few thousand dollars, that Mexican saddle. Is there any chance to pan over and see it? Get a shot of it later. Pardon me? I'll get a shot of it later. Yeah. And that, pre that was presented to me by the cowboys and stuntmen after a picture. And it was a very, very valuable item. A Mexican saddle, you know. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. I'm afraid you're going to hate this question, but I, I do want to ask you about courage. Would you say that courage was something that one acquired or something that one was born with? Well, how do you expect me to answer that? Because your work, your films, are full of courageous people. Your activities in the war are full of courage. And you've chronicled some of the most historically courageous incidents in history, you do seem to be interested in courage. I don't know. I've tried to figure it out. I am a... I am really a coward. I know I am. So that's why I did foolish things. And I was decorated eight or nine times. Trying to prove that I was not a coward. But after it's all over, I still knew that I still know that I was a coward. I've always found out the little quiet little man that nobody pays any attention to usually has more guts. Can you use guts from BBC? Hmm? Sure. Has more guts and courage than the big blowhard, the big noisy, you know, the big outspoken fellow. It's the little man that does the courageous thing. Courage is a thing that does not belong to any nation, you know, any class of people. I mean, for example, I mean, we, uh, people laughed at the Italian army. But among our medals of honor, first, of course, the Irish, and second, the Italians, third, Mexican-Americans, 
and fourth Anglo-Saxons. I mean, something that occurs as something I don't know. It's pretty, pretty hard to find. Look in the dictionary and of three dictionaries, you find three different de definitions of courage. I wouldn't know. All I know is that I'm not courageous. Oh, you go ahead and do a thing, but I mean, after it's all over, your knees start shaking. <laughs> if you don't believe me, look at that. There's some, something out there where my wife has all my medals. I didn't put them there, she did. <laughs> medals so, for so-called gallantry in action. So-called because I was not gallant or anything else. It just happened that way. Your films often depict bloodshed and violence, and yet I get the feeling that you hate violence. C can you explain this? I do. And my pictures do not always show violence. Very, very few of them do. And if they do show violence, it's over very quickly. I suggest it more than anything else. I never show a long sequence, I mean, with violence. I do it quickly, or I do it by suggestion. I hate violence in pictures just as much as I do these sex and incest and all the things that are going on now. Sometimes the story calls for it and you have to do it. But I have to deny you when you say that my pictures, I mean, show a lot of violence. I do not. Scene 256, take one. Mr. Ford, would you tell me about that magnificent saddle there? Mm. Well, tell me first, are you enjoying your mild and bitter? It is absolutely marvellous, thank you. It's almost as bad as English beer, isn't it? Not quite. Huh? Not quite. <laughs> Not quite? Not quite as bad. There's one thing we have in common. England and the United States we make the worst beer in the world. This is, this is ginger beer. For the sake of my... Uh, image. Image. My oh. audience. Not for my image, my people back home. Where? What about the what about the saddle? Oh, that's uh, that is a Mexican parade saddle. It's worth many many hundreds of dollars. And they're very very expensive. It was given to me by the cowboys and stuntmen at the finish of the picture. And there's a tremendous amount of silver on it. And it's a very very beautiful thing. I personally would never use it to ride, never ride a horse on it with it. Uh, I use the McClellan saddle, that's the army saddle. And, uh, but here in California, you see them at parades and things. It's, uh, I think, the what they call a charro saddle. And, yet, and, and it's, it's a wonderful gift, but. Uh, just there as a decoration. I mean, God, I'd never put it on a poor horse. It's probably break his back. But it is a lovely thing. Cut it. Right, right. Uh, take one. Now, what were we talking about before the last commercial? <laughs> I'd like to ask you this. You've given me a very good example this afternoon.